this is going to be the last uh, in the this series on the Hodge conjecture. I've really accomplished most of my purpose, which was to give, as I said, a tour of con connections between mathematical ideas and not getting to anything as uh, modern and complicated as the Hodge conjecture itself, but to talk about uh, I various ideas that connect these big four big branches of mathematics. Um, but now I do want to finish up by at least approaching um, the real statement of the Hodge conjecture in, in some form. The first thing is to go to higher dimensions. And I'm not going to say a lot about that, but just I want to make sure it's not uh, the scary thing. Um, all of our pictures have been in two dimensions, or some in three dimensions, like when we had these cones and talked about conic sections. And I talked a little bit about how those pictures really, when you look at complex numbers, they were in, in four dimensions. And we talked a little bit about rotating in four dimensions, which is hard to picture. Um, so how to think about four higher dimensions. If you're, if you're thinking four dimensions was hard enough, um, how on earth do you think about higher dimensions? Well, the main thing is that we've seen there's an incredibly tight link between algebra and geometry. And what you need to do mostly to think about higher dimensions is trust the algebra. When you've got algebra, higher dimensions just mean more variables, more numbers, and not a qualitative um, increase in complexity, just a quantitative increase in complexity. The picture, the geometric side, is true that you're not going to be able to directly picture it as much. And, um, and that makes it, makes it a bit harder. But the key thing is that there shouldn't be, you shouldn't think of it as a, a qualitative um, change. And I want to point out, real briefly, you've actually done many, many calculations in higher dimensions, even if you don't realize it. Um, for example, here's a hypothetical spreadsheet for a bunch of restaurants. These are a bunch of locations in Albuquerque. Um, and the products that they sell. So here's how they sold 189 enchiladas at the Coors location and so on some particular day. I just made this up, by the way. It's not real sales data. Um, but look at how many numbers there are. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 uh, stores and 6. There are 72 different numbers here. I claim that this defines a point in a 72-dimensional space. This is not something you, you would look at and say, oh my god, I could never understand this. It's 72-dimensional geometry. But this really does define a point in a 72-dimensional space. But if you go back to Descartes, almost my very first slide, um, he said a point in the plane is defined by a pair of numbers. A point in space is defined by a triple of numbers. Well, this is 72 different numbers, all of which can change independently. That's a point in 72-dimensional space. And so whenever you do your balance your checkbook or use a spreadsheet or uh, look at your grades in a class or look at baseball statistics, you're in principle doing higher dimensional geometry. Um, you're probably not asking incredibly geometric questions or thinking about it in a geometric way, but there are there is geometry to be done there. So the main thing is that higher dimensions just means more numbers. Yes, it's harder to visualize. And interestingly enough, it's only sometimes that it's harder to analyze. It turns out that some things get easier when you have more dimensions. Um, if you look at, for example, the Poincaré conjecture, the one of the Millennium Prize problems that has been answered, um, the Poincaré conjecture is uh, kind of trivial in one and two dimensions um, and is actually not super hard by modern standards in five and more dimensions. It's only in three dimensions three and four that it's really, really hard and interesting anymore. Um, and that the, the three-dimensional case was the um, the case that was recently proved with a lot of work. Um, so it, the main thing, though, is that uh, higher dimensions are not qualitatively different. Yes, often more interesting stuff can happen there because you have more wiggle room, but um, you don't want to be scared of them. You just want to think, oh, it's just more variables, more numbers, and any picture I draw is necessarily going to be highly schematic because it's not going to be a, a very literal representation. Okay, so here's what we do. Here's the setting for the Hodge conjecture. Start with the plane, like we did at the very start of talk number one, or start with ordinary three-dimensional space, or a higher dimensional space, and just think, well, I'm going to picture that basically as three-dimensional space, but I know there's more variables, and I know I might be misleading my intuition a little bit. Then make all your coordinates complex. Okay, Instead of x1 being a real variable, it's going to be a1 plus b1i, and x2 is going to be a2 plus b2i, etc. So you've got, uh, now you've got 2n. Uh, real variables coming in, but paired in terms of n complex numbers. Okay, so that was the idea of, of bringing in complex numbers, which was so crucial. Now we add appropriate points at infinity. 
Just like with the projective plane, we had to add a line at infinity, we add a bunch of points at infinity in a very well-defined, well-understood way to make complex, projective, that's from the infinity part, n-dimensional space, and it's called CPN. Okay, complex projective n space. Now, if we only ever did that and made that our universe, it'd actually be pretty simple, because that's just sort of one universe to live in. What we do then is we make a nice universe sitting inside of CPN, a smaller universe. So you might want to think of a sphere sitting inside of three dimensions, or like the surface of the Earth. Like practically for our lives on the Earth, we don't really live in three-dimensional space so much because um, we can't go out into inner, outer space or go deep into the Earth. We kind of live on a two-dimensional surface inside three-dimensional space. So that's the kind of thing um, you want to picture. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that. Technically, what we want to create is a smooth, complex, algebraic variety. What that means is we're going to take all of CPN, all of these coordinates, we're going to use algebraic equations to make a smaller space inside that. That's what the algebraic variety means. It's going to be complex because we start with the complex numbers throughout. And it also is supposed to be smooth. Let me just say a little bit about that. Um, smoothness is really a calculus condition, so it's really coming back to calculus. Here's a, a, one of Dan Freed's slides. It's just a nice basic slide for this. If you make your universe by saying, let's lo look at only the points that it, where y squared equals x cubed, it turns out that's a bad idea. If you actually graph that, it has this what's called a cusp, which looks like a sharp corner. And in fact, it's such a sharp corner that the more you blow it up, this is a blown up version, it, the sharper it gets. So it's really a 180 degree turn right at a point. That's an incredibly sharp corner. And in fact, any kind of sharp corner is illegal. Um, that's not the kind of universe we want to live in. Y equals x cubed, on the other hand, we've seen that graphed already, that if you take this seemingly interesting point and put it under a microscope, it gets flatter and flatter. So the universe we live in should look flat under a microscope. One of the consequences of that is something I was saying before with the topology, is that locally every point looks like every other point. So here's a, a little higher dimensional example. Here's a surface in three-dimensional space, and it intersects itself. If I'm at a point right here, or a point here, or a point here, or a point here, they all look the same, and they all basically look like maybe a slightly bent flat plane. And the more you put a microscope on it, it turns out, the more flat it looks. So to an ant, this point, and this point, and this point look all the same. But to that ant, this, this line here where these two sheets intersect looks very different. There's sort of four definitely different ways to go, and if you put a microscope on it, it's never going to look like anything that doesn't have like this X shape. Similarly, over here with the cone, um, every point here, 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 here looks the same. It's nice and smooth. Yeah, it's slightly bent, but when you put a microscope on it, it looks less and less bent. But the cone point, assuming it comes to a precise sharp point up here, that's very different. So this is not a smooth point of this surface. These are not smooth points of this surface. So impor important thing is that I'm not saying that these are not interesting objects to put inside our universe. If our universe was big enough to fit this object or this object inside it, they'd be totally legal. Similarly, if, I, if we're working in the projective plane, these are both legal objects to study. I'm just saying that those are not the kinds of universe we want to live in. So in the universe we live in, we start with a huge space that's really simple, CPN, projective N space. Then we cut it down to size, um, but we disallow these kinds of shapes. And then we study objects inside it. So here's the picture. Um, oh yeah, one more thing. Um, remember that we started out being inside projective space. We added a bunch of points at infinity. That means that if I, describe, if I define a universe inside that, there's going to be no holes and no way to escape off to infinity. Because if I try to go off to infinity, it's, that it's already there, and I just kind of teleport back to an ordinary point, basically. Okay? So that ensures, as we've seen before, that algebraic cycles will always be topological cycles. They'll be closed curves, even though the pictures often don't look like it. So here's the, here's the kind of schematic, two versions of the schematic picture. Here's an, a highly schematic picture. X means whatever complex, smooth, smooth complex projective variety we've got. So this kind of the interior of this ellipse is kind of an extremely schematic picture. So this, the whole square, the whole rectangle here would be CPN, and then X would be some nice um, algebraic variety with inside that, a smooth universe to live in, defined by algebra. And then these red things would be the cycles that are the objects we're studying inside.
a little less schematic picture would be like this. Maybe you can think of all three-dimensional space as analogous to CPN, our kind of starting place. Then we use algebraic equations to cut it down to a smaller place. That's our new universe for study. And then we draw some kind of funky object inside that. Okay. So here's the rules. CPN was definitely a very algebraic object. It's extremely rigid. Then we use an algebraic equation or multiple algebraic equations to cut that down to size to be a, a, a more interesting universe that might have kind of interesting holes and shapes and all kinds of stuff. But we still used algebra to create the universe. Okay, so it's an algebraic variety. Our universe is defined by algebraic equations, solutions to algebraic equations. Now we invite the topologist over to play, and we say, go, go for it. Just draw some topological cycle and morph it around as you topologists like to do as much as you possibly want, and then I'm gonna, gonna look for, as you're morphing it around, is it possible for you to, re to, um, to get something that's created by more algebra? Because if you take this algebraic universe we're starting with, the whole big thing, and we say, well, what if we want points that satisfy yet more algebraic equations? To cut it down to size even more, you're gonna get algebraic cycles, like these kinds of things, inside our algebraic universe. If we start out with a topologist version, a topological cycle, is it always going to be morphable into an algebraic cycle? So a flexible object, can it be rigidified? That's an extremely, uh, it's an extremely general kind of uh, question in mathematics. I have a big class of flexible objects, can they be rigidified? Um, it's actually very much like, let me be a little annoying and page up a bunch. It's a, a lot like what we were seeing here. That a topologist draws this kind of wacky red curve, and he can morph it around it as, as he likes. And the, oh, let me go back to here. And this red curve. And the geometer says, I like things that are extraordinarily nice in as many ways as possible. I'm going to create this vector field and nothing else. I'm going to create this very rigid, special, highly ordered kind of fluid flow that represents what the topologist was talking about. Okay. And so it's, the Hodge conjecture is very, very similar to that. That's another reason I wanted to, to talk about that example with the Duram stuff. Okay, so here's the, here's the question. Now, there's two things you have to check. First of all, if, if the topological cycle doesn't have real dimension, if it, I say it doesn't have even uh, number of real dimensions, if it's not defined by an even number of real coordinates, then it can't come from a complex cycle because in complex numbers, all the coordinates are paired. So first, you just don't let the topologist draw anything that doesn't have even dimension. Now, is it the same as some algebraic cycle? Well, turns out, easy to check no. Um, there is a necessary condition that's it's a more, more precise version of the, the even dimension thing. You don't just check how many dimensions it has. You look at how it sits with real imaginary parts. And locally, it must look like those are paired appropriately. The way Dan Fried talks about it is at every point in this topological cycle, you can look at how the real and imaginary part, uh, parts of the coordinates are kind of, uh, of um, paired together, and you can calculate what's called a rotation number, um, or at least he calls it a rotation number. I've never seen it called that in any other literature about this, but it's a good word. Um, and it's extraordinarily roughly analogous. This is really stretching things. It's roughly analogous to what, what I was talking about with the local circulation of a fluid. It's not a horrible thing to picture, is kind of picture a little water wheel and seeing if it turns in a certain way. Okay? The main thing is that it's a straightforward calculus calculation by the standards of this kind of mathematics. And it's local. That at every point you can sort of verify, is this, not, is this going in a direction that is not violating the rule that real and imaginary needs, need to be paired in a way that basically says they're coming from the complex numbers. Because remember, the topologist doesn't care about that. It doesn't know anything about algebra. So you've got to check at least that condition. Well, that's what I was alluding to before in the previous video. There are a couple of, the, the topologist needs to, um, in addition to it being a topological cycle, they need to check that it has real dimension, and they need to check this rotation number equal to zero condition. But those are local conditions. Okay, and here's the Hodge conjecture statement says that in a smooth, complex, projective algebraic variety, as I've described, the universe that we're living in, the algebraic universe, any topological cycle, which is seemingly a very flexible, floppy object, 
with even dimension, which definitely had to be true, and zero rotation number, which was a more subtle but still local condition, is equivalent to an algebraic cycle. And I put a little star here because it's not quite true. You have to do what's called a rational combination of algebraic cycles. But that's a real just technicality. Um, it's basically saying that a floppy object in a rigid universe can be rigidified. That's a really nice way to think about it. What's the significance of this? To wrap it up pretty quickly here. Um, the main significance is that it's just incredibly beautiful and it unifies two hugely useful but different ways of analyzing spaces. The algebraic and algebraic geometers way of things, which is very rigid, and the topologist way of, of and, and also the calculus. As I said, um, that rotation number calculation, for example, is a calculus calculation. So there's topology and uh, calculus and differential topology and differential geometry coming in and they have their own way of producing spaces and analyzing them. The algebraic geometer has their own way of producing space and analyzing them. It says that basically the algebra, algebraic or rigid approach and the topolo topological or flexible approach are going to detect the same things. Um, very analogous to the Bouzou's theorem situation. It could be, if it's true, it could be the foundation for an incredibly deep combination of algebra and topology. Um, it turns out that, that there's these big theory, there's be, these big uh, sort of machines and theories waiting out there ready to go that depend on this conjecture and other conjectures like it. Um, and if this conjecture is false, then those machines for analysis, which are incredibly powerful, are not going to work nearly as well. Turns out there's analogs to this in number theory. I haven't mentioned number theory hardly at all, but algebraic geometry has deep, deep connections to number theory. And you might think all this stuff about like smoothness and, and spaces and loops and stuff, how could it have to do with something as discrete as numbers? Turns out, um, surprisingly enough, it does, but you have to you have to really work for it. Okay, um, and I'm just going to end with this slide. Back to the web of ideas, we've seen that various theorems, like uh, things about transversality, Bazou's theorem, uh, the Hodge theorem, Duram, they connect uh, two or three of these things. And there's some, there's other things that connect all of them at once. But the Hodge conjecture is a great example of something that it really does connect all of them at once. You have to understand a lot from each one to even understand precisely, meaningfully, the Hodge conjecture. But also, if it's true, it says that there's even more deep connections between these fields than we would have thought. And that's the end.